establishing before it falls off. <laughs> Like it worked out all right. I'd like to welcome everyone to our candidates debate for the at large city council candidates uh, here at the Beverly Cove Improvement Association. My name is James McNeil. I'm the president of this association. Um, we were established in 1925 uh, with a very lofty objective that goes on for a few pages. But I think the relevant bits are, and I'll quote, it's 1925 English, so bear with me. Advancing objects relating to the general interest and welfare of the Cove section of the city. Furnishing information to its members and others, which will broaden their knowledge of men and public measures, thereby enabling them to become influential factors in all questions of social and civic importance. See, don't you wish you were born in 1910 and you could write like that? So basically, I think it's our, our job is to promote uh, civic discourse and um, help people make more informed decisions about their elected leaders and policies that affect us in the city. That's in uh, 2017 English. So without any further ado, let's, no, I forgot to make a plug, sorry. This association is run by members. It comprises members uh, for a nominal fee. You can be a member. Uh, and this, <laughs> this lovely building is the venue where we hold a lot of events like this one, some for members, some for the community at large. Uh, on the 10th of November, we have a community campfire. It's going to happen outside on our property over there in the corner. Uh, just a campfire, come hang out and uh, bring the kids and have a good time. On the 1st of December, we're going to do a caroling uh, event. Uh, just That will also have a bonfire. And uh, Ray Novak, who some people may know, is going to provide the music and folks are going to sing along. This is the second year we've done that. So those are just a few events that are upcoming. I want to make sure you uh, do about them. Follow us on Facebook to find out more. Um, now, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the debate format. Uh, the candidates, who are six to my left here, uh, are already apprised of what we're about to do. I've, I've sent them the format in advance, but not the questions. So we're going to, um, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce the VIPs and the candidates themselves that are here. After that, we'll get into, um, we'll just dive right into the questions. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do is each candidate is gonna give a two minute um, introduction to themselves, and that's up to them how they wanna present themselves. And then uh, following that, it'll be, it'll be questions that uh, the Cove uh, Association prepared in advance. I will pose some of those questions. Each of the six will get one minute to answer. Uh, it's it's going to be fast, fast paced, um, and uh, after I've asked a few of my questions, I'm going to uh, refer to a few of the questions that were left in our box in the back by concerned citizens. Uh, we we got a lot of them, but thank you. We're not going to ask them all, so please don't be offended if we don't pick yours. Time is of the essence. Uh, we have timekeepers, Walter and Lois, sitting in the front. I'll introduce them to the six candidates. These are, these are your best friends tonight. Um, <laughs> and yeah, we, we have to be rather brutal about the timekeeping because we just don't have a lot of time. And, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so Walter, we'll get Lois and Walter will give you the warnings, uh, 15 second warning or the 30 second warning, what have you. Um, okay, just lastly to say, just a caveat that uh, like all of you, I have another job during the day. I'm not a professional moderator. I've never uh, moderated a debate like this. So if you think I should do something differently, or if I forgot or omitted something, just yell out, raise your hand, tell me, set me straight. I won't take offense. Um, so far, so good? Okay. So uh, let me start by uh, welcoming uh, Mayor Cahill, who's in the audience somewhere. Welcome down there. I tried, to, I tried to convince him to say a few words, but he wants to reserve the time for, for the candidates who are in the competitive races. So uh, we appreciate that, and we appreciate you coming. Um, after, I think I would like to introduce two, two other of our elected officials who are not going to be debating, but they are uh, our ward. Um, uh, sorry, we'll start with John. John is uh, our city uh, school committee member. Or not, you want to just say hello? Or? 
A lot of people may not know you. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for having us here tonight and giving us as candidates the opportunity to uh, get one more message out to the public so close to election day, so we really appreciate it. Uh, the other day I was at a um, Halloween party at the Hastings House and had the chance to hear um, Nancy Frady's talk uh, before the costume contest, which I'm a little bitter about that Matt's daughter conveniently won the, uh, the group one, but her makeup was pretty good, so I'll give you credit for that. But anyway, one of the things that uh, Nancy said, which she talked about what makes Beverly great is a sense of community. I think we see that here today. And you don't have to raise your hands, even though I'm a teacher, but if this is the first campaign you've ever volunteered on or ran, or the first time you hear a candidate night, I think it's really important to take that passion and commitment uh, and keep going forward with it. Um, decisions get made by people who show up, uh, which is from one of my favorite TV shows, The West Wing, which is basically like chicken soup for the liberal soul. <laughs> but if you have a passion or you have ideas about how to improve our home and our city, uh, after the election, you should keep staying involved, write letters, join a committee, volunteer. There's probably applications to, be, to become a member here, so it would be a great op opportunity thank to. You. So thank you very much for coming here tonight. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I meant to say all that, but I, I wasn't as eloquent, so I'd like to say That's great. Thank you very much. Thanks for showing up. Yeah. Uh, uh, second uh, VIP local official, I'd like to introduce Scott Hausman. He's the Ward 4 um, City Councilor. Yeah. Good, good evening to those of you who don't know me. I'm, I'm Scott. Uh, first, I want to thank the, uh, the Association and James for putting together this event. It's, it's really the first one we've had like this in the city. Uh, where the candidates will, in front of an audience, be asked uh, questions back and forth. So it, it's very important, and I want to second what John said about, about civic engagement. Uh, democracy doesn't happen by itself. We all have to show up. We all have to participate. Um, and I know that all of the candidates here have a passion and love for the city of Beverly. That's why they're here. And I hope that, that as time goes on, you will continue to uh, not simply leave city government to the folks who are elected, um, who have the privilege of serving you, but also remain engaged throughout the year, because we have a lot of important uh, issues before city, uh, before the city. Uh, we have to be fiscally re uh, resilient. We have to be environmentally resilient, um, and so we have a lot of challenges. And it's up to not only us, but but you, to help us. Uh, define what the moment is and define what we really have to do. So uh, without further ado, um, uh, I hope to give both John and I uh, your vote. We're both unopposed, um, but, but very, uh, very honored to be serving you. Uh, and with that, I'll just turn it over to the candidates. We have a great selection this evening, and so let's, let's get on with it. Okay. Thank you, James. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Scott. And uh, also, thanks for clarifying for everyone that uh, you, you, you two are both are running, you just happen to be unopposed, which is why we're, we have it, as is, as is Mayor Cahill. Um, so, yeah, so the real, the real action is with the at-large uh, city council candidates. So we'll get into this. Um, we're gonna, uh, there are refreshments in the back. Um, it's much easier for us to not pack those away or take them home. So please, don't be shy, it's there. I was gonna say it's free, it's not free. Somebody paid for it, but it's free to you. So please help yourself. Um, so I, I think, and just, just to check in about time, um, I don't want to go past nine, pre preferably. If, if things are really, you know, exciting and you just can't, we just can't stop, I mean, we may go a little bit over nine, but yeah, I am aware that if it goes on too long, it, it gets a bit difficult uh, on a school night like this. So uh, we're going to be going through it quickly. Um, remember the re Republican uh, debates, the 2016 for president. They had 10 on the stage, and they managed. So, I guess they managed. <laughs> I don't know how much of a debate it was. So, let's, um, I think what I'd like to do is, I'm just gonna quickly introduce each of the candidates, but after they're gonna introduce themselves in, in more in depth. So, I'm not gonna say too much. Just to, you may not be able to see their name tags. Um, what, what I will do when you, when you introduce yourselves, uh, folks, is why don't you stand up so everyone can see you clearly and uh, give your 
you know, your two-minute intro to yourself, uh, holding the mic that's behind you. I'll hand it to you, don't worry. Um, but I think during the debate itself, when we're talking about issues, I think probably staying seated is easier, uh, just because of timing. Now, um, Brian Dapis is our first candidate uh, to my left. Um, he's a Dartmouth Street resident, um, longtime Beverly resident. Um, he's uh, the, uh, a principal uh, of the Mega Group, which is a commercial real estate firm, uh, Beverly Rotary Club member, and uh, uh, many other in committee involvements. Um, uh, Michael Flaherty, uh, longtime Beverly resident as well. I'm sorry. <laughs> there, were, there were so many Fla there's so many kids in that family. I can't keep it straight. Uh, <laughs> I'm from the same tribe, so I can make jokes about Irish. Uh, so uh, currently, uh, Cape Ann executive director of the YMCA of Cape Ann, uh, and a, a funeral director at the Campbell Funeral Home. Uh, six terms, councilor at large, uh, also city council president. Uh, so many committees served and many volunteer positions, uh, too numerous to, to go through. Um, uh, next, uh, before, you know what, to make this a little more streamlined, I should just say all six of these candidates um, are Beverly residents, clearly, uh, long-term Beverly residents, um, parents, even Grandparents. I know they look young, but there are grandparents here. One point out who. So, uh, kids in Beverly Public Schools, uh, and just impressive people with long resumes. Uh, so, I, just to say, we're really fortunate to have uh, such a great selection. And um, so, just leave it at that. And also, I think their just their personal lives uh, exemplify or that their commitment to not only public service but using the public services and being part of the public life of the city. So. That, that, that goes to all six. So for Julie, uh, Julie Flowers is one of the ministers at the First Baptist Church in Beverly. Uh, she's a resident of Monroe Street, uh, born and raised here in Beverly, member of the Rotary Club, Hannah School PTO, and many other involvement. Uh, Paul Guancy is uh, our current city council president. Uh, he's a resident of Cross Lane. Um, Elected first in 1999, served four terms, three as president, and then later in 2010 he came back um, for three more terms of city council, and he's currently the president. Uh, he owns Super Sub downtown in casual catering. A familiar face around town, and so, uh, yeah. I'll, uh, moving along, Esther Goto. How'd I do? Yeah. <laughs> She gave me a tutorial earlier. Uh, Esther has lived in Beverly as long as I have. Since 2001, that's when I moved to Beverly, that's when she moved to Beverly with her daughter from her native Kenya. Um, she is a registered nurse, uh, public health and housing advocate, member of the Beverly Human Rights Committee, um, and she's currently a doctoral student for public health. Um, Matt St. Hilaire is a resident of West Street, uh, incumbent as well, two-term city council at large. Uh, also grew up in Beverly. Um, he currently works for Governor Charlie Baker in the governor's office. Um, and uh, yeah, members, uh, many committees, and, and uh, he can tell you more about that. Like I said, the resumes are long and thick. And uh, I almost feel embarrassed and ashamed to read him, but you know, I'm just a mere mortal. <laughs> no, uh, I don't know how you guys do it, but anyway, we're glad you do. So why don't we just go through uh, if, one by one, and we'll give you two minutes. Please don't be offended when you see the 30-second sign. It's all in the interest of the public common good. <laughs> go ahead, Brian. All right. Yeah. Can we all hear? Uh, good evening, folks. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Brian DePeace. I'm, I'm 46 years old. I live on Dartmouth Street with my wife Jennifer and our two young boys. Uh, Christopher is six years old, goes to the North Beverly Elementary School. Uh, my son Nikki is four years old. He, he attends the Integrated uh, Intensive Preschool Program uh, sponsored by the Beverly Public Schools. I am a 1997 uh, graduate of Northeastern University. I have an accounting degree. Uh, as said earlier, I'm a member of the Beverly Rotary Club. I'm also a board of directors member at the Beverly Children's Learning Center. It's a um, preschool and after school program for children under the age of 13 here in Beverly. Uh, I am the principal of the Mega Group. It's a commercial real estate firm that does business from Portland, Maine to South Boston. 
I specialize in the uh, IRS Code 1031 tax deferred exchanges. Um, as a city council, I'll advocate for children with special needs. I'll advocate um, for an equi equitable public education for them. Uh, I will be mindful of traffic in our downtown and the effect new traffic has on our natural, I'm sorry, and, and the effect new traffic, new development has on our natural resources. Um, I'll advocate for a full day kindergarten, uh, support of the uh, special education department. Uh, I will advocate for not selling the Briscoe Middle School site. And um, I would like to work with the Beverly Police Department and introduce a program called the Emergency Responders Information Network. I can t talk about that all night later on. <laughs> Very exciting for me. That's it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. With, the, with that, <laughs> I'm asking for one of your three at-large votes for city council. I almost forgot that one. Again. Thanks. <laughs> uh, so, Tim, if I may interject briefly, I forgot to remind folks, uh, during the debate itself, let's hold the applause until after. Uh, but I think at this, at this stage, it's fine to applaud after each introduction. But go ahead, please. Thank you, James, and thanks for having us tonight. My name is Tim Flaherty. I'm a lifelong resident of Beverly, as, he, as James said. I'm married to Ann Flaherty, who's a Beverly High School teacher. She's actually at Open House tonight. But she's been doing that for over 25 years. I've been married to her for about 24 years. We have four children that all attended Beverly's public schools, uh, North Beverly, Briscoe, and Beverly High School. I myself uh, went to St. John's Elementary School here in Beverly and a graduate of Beverly High School class in 1985. I went to Northeast University, studied political science. Then I went on to receive a degree in funeral science from Fine College. Presently, I am the KPN Executive Director. I oversee a, a budget of about $4 million and about 150 employees. I have been involved in many activities uh, throughout the city and the city council, but things that I've done, the community involvement, I've been the McPherson Youth Center Director, I've been elected member of the Billy Charter Commission, I've been, a, I've been a youth coach, I've been the Billy Homecoming Chairman for several years. I understand the commitment and the hard work it takes to be a city councilor. I did it for 12 years and two, two uh, terms as council president. I want to do it in a deliberate but respectful way, the way I've always done things in Beverly. I take great pride in what I do, I take great pride in my family. To me, this is serious business, and I understand what it takes in the next two years to make a better Beverly. Thank you. Hi, my name is Julie Flowers, and I want to thank all of you for being here tonight and also thank the association for hosting this wonderful forum for us, so thank you. I am one of three ministers at First Baptist Church in Beverly. That's my professional work. That is the uh, brick church with the tall white steeple down on Cabot Street, if you're not sure which one that is. I grew up in Beverly in the house that my parents still live in on Lyman Street, which is one of the sort of crisscrossing one-way streets that go back and forth by the high school. And I went to McKay Elementary School during that time. My younger sister Emily and I would walk to McKay School. Um, that's the one that's by the golf and tennis club, although it's no longer a functional school in the city. Then we attended Memorial Middle School, which is on the site where the new middle school is set to open in the fall. And I graduated from Beverly High School in 1997. Uh, Tim's wife, Ann, was actually the athletic trainer. When I was there, I played soccer and ran track. And my senior year uh, spring track, I was the captain, but did not get to run because of shin splints. But Ann dutifully would tape my legs every single time there was a meet on the off chance that I was going to go run. I am also a single mom to a six-year-old boy named Emmett. He is a first grader at Hannah Elementary School. And the last form that we had, I forgot to introduce him during the introduction, so I want to make sure to get that in right up front, because it's a very important part of my life. As you heard, I'm a member of the Hannah School PTO, an active member of the Beverly Rotary Club. I'm on the Harbolite Nursery School Board of Directors as well, which is a longtime Beverly Nursery School here in the community that's affordable and accessible. I am really excited to have this opportunity to run for city councilor at large. 
to take some of the community building work and, and your voices that I've gotten to hear in 10 years professionally working in the community and uh, building volunteer relationships and be able to elevate those to the city level. So I would be honored to be considered for one of your three votes on November 7th. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. James, thank you. You're doing a great job. And I must say, the building looks beautiful since your renovation project, especially the kitchen. Um, this is the first time this whole campaign season that the six of us have been able to sit together like this and answer questions from the public. And it's great that it's being broadcast to BevCam. My name's Paul Guanci. I've had the honor of serving uh, on the city council as president the past six years. This is my second tenure on the city council, as James mentioned. Previously, I served from 2000 to 2007 uh, and stepped down after three years as president to spend time with my young family. I had just had my third child and to attend to business concerns. I live in the Cove neighborhood with my wife, Kristen, and three children. Anna, she's 22. She's a nurse at Beverly Hospital. My son, Noah, is 12. He's at Briscoe. And my daughter, Julia, is 10, and she's still at the Cove. After graduating from St. Anselm College in 1986, I know, how do I look that old? Or how am I that old? <laughs> uh, I began my professional career, for better or worse, running my family's business, Super Sub Casual Catering, which was founded in 1970. Uh, it's been a busy two years on this council. My colleagues and I have been involved in the middle school building project, zoning changes, monitoring road work. Uh, we, we promise it'll be done next year. Uh, tending to the financial well-being of the city, and of course, delivering top-notch constituent services. The city of Beverly has been well served the past two decades by having a city council that works respectfully and cooperatively with the mayor's office. I have been honored to be part of that working relationship through three different mayors. Uh, and in the past, have received endorsements from the Salem Evening News that praised our teamwork spirit here in Beverly. Thank you. I must start by asking you not to hold me too tight on time. I think in my native language, but I have to speak in English. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. My name is Esther Godder. I am humbled and honored to have received the signatures to appear on the ballot as a counselor at large in this city. I am humbled and honored to be the first American citizen of African descent to hold this honor. I am proud to say that I have attained this candidacy as an immigrant. I'm proud and honored to say that I started serving the Beverly community immediately I arrived here in 2001. First, as an undocumented immigrant and while we, being processed, waiting to be processed, I volunteered at the North Shore Elder Services where I accompanied the elders to their medical appointments. I then worked as a geriatric nurse in uh, nursing homes on the North Shore, and I also worked as a registered nurse here in Beverly in home care. I have volunteered uh, to serve breakfast to the veterans with Rick, and I'm currently volunteering to serve hot meals on wheels the elderly in our community. I am a member of the Beverly Human Rights Committee, and I have worked as a public health and housing advocate here in Massachusetts. I thank everyone who has supported my candidacy in person with signatures, emails, and by phone, stating how you want me to represent you. Your responses have been a great honor, and I'm proud to say that if elected as your counselor at large on November 7th, I will do everything within my, my capacity to represent those who, who will vote for me and those who will not. I represent diversity, and I'm a military mom. I am carrying on a family legacy to serve as a United States citizen in public service.
Okay, thank you. I have a Good evening. Uh, thank you to James and to the Cove Improvement Association for hosting this event tonight. My name is Matt St. Hilaire, and I'm one of your incumbent city councilors at large, and I'm currently running for a third term. I grew up in Beverly, attended Beverly Public Schools, and graduated from Beverly High School in the class of 95. My wife, Elizabeth, uh, is also from Beverly. She graduated two years behind me. And together, you know, we, we've been married for the last 12 years. We've got three young kids, our daughter, Emma, who is 10, our daughter, Charlotte, who is nine, and our son, Bowden, who is five. After high school, I graduated from Villanova University with a degree in political science, and I've spent the majority of my career working in government and in the political arena. For the last three years, I've had the privilege of serving Governor Charlie Baker in the governor's office at the State House. I'm honored to have Governor Baker's endorsement in this race. He's been a great example of how effective government can be when folks are willing to work together, and I've tried hard to follow his lead here at the, here at the local level. Over the last four years, I've really enjoyed working with Mayor Cahill, my colleagues on the city council, and I'm very proud of what we've accomplished so far. We approved a, a new middle school project. That project remains on time and on budget, and our new school will be open next year. We've committed to building our stabilization fund. In 2014, when I joined the council, we had $750,000 in that account. Today, we have $9.3 million in that account, and our city is in a strong financial position. We've attracted companies like Krona and Hi-Res Biosolutions, high-tech manufacturers that are bringing good jobs to Beverly, and our local economy is thriving. As your city councilor, I've been a strong voice for Beverly's taxpayers and for maintaining fiscal responsibility. I've been committed to transparency, and I listen to residents' feedback, and I've been a strong supporter of our schools. I believe Beverly's headed in the right direction, and I believe I have the experience to continue serving on the city council to help make the best decisions for our future. Thank you. Yeah, let's do that. Um. Uh, so let's, uh, let's, let's dive right in. Thanks for those great introductions. And uh, I, perhaps not everyone got to say everything that was on their mind or on their sheet, but uh, there's this, this more time to you know, fit that in. And we'll have a closing statement at the end as well. Um, so let's let's go right in. I'm just going to go uh, put out the questions. What we'll do is uh, we'll start with Brian at this end, and we'll just go right down the line. And for the next question, maybe we'll start at the other end and come this way, and, and we'll mix it up a bit like that. Um, if you forgot the question by the time it gets to you, I'll repeat it. Don't worry. If people start to stray off into other domains, I probably will repeat the question again just to bring us back in uh, to, to keep us focused. So, um, uh, we have pre-prepared questions, and we have questions from the audience who came tonight. Uh, I see some, uh, there, is, there is some uh, convergence here, so I think the first question is going to be a combo of what, we were, of what I was thinking of posing, and also with the questions we got from the audience. Uh, three or four of them start with, with all the new buildings on Rantoul Street, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Okay, so let's, let's focus on the question of uh, Beverly has seen substantial growth and development in the past five years or so, in particular those downtown projects that are on people's minds. Where is this development leading us? And what is your vision for Beverly's growth for the next 10 years? And specifically, um, if the tax base is expanding, then why do taxes keep going up? So there's a lot in there. You can take it where you want. Uh, we'll go one, one minute at a time. Go for it. OK. Uh, specific to the downtown, right? Not Folly Hill or anywhere else? You, you can you okay. go Downtown. Here we go. Yeah. Um, I think what the city is doing downtown uh, has been very positive. Um, the mayor's office and um, City Hall has been uh, converting a lot of underperforming, underpaying uh, 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 properties tax-wise, that is, and um, develop, developing them into um, much better taxpayers. Um, one of the concerns I have is the amount of traffic that we'll see when all these developments are done and the effect that all of this new development will have on our natural resources. Um, I know that the city is trying to do something over on River Street on the waterfront. I think it's a great idea, uh, longer term for Beverly and for the growth of our community, but um, 
the people I've spoke to downtown in Ward 1 and in Ward 2 um, don't want to see anything like that happen right now. Um, I think the businesses have had a lot of downfall with respect to detours and things like that, and I'm afraid of their long-term growth if we continue with the traffic and whatnot. Thank Thanks, uh, Tim. I won't ask you to repeat the question, but it's a lot to get in within, within <laughs> one minute. I believe Belly's heading in the right direction, but I always talk about balance. And someone asked me the other day, what, what does the balance look like? We need to have residential and commercial growth within our city. We also have to have balance. We can't go too fast too soon. And I know like the downtown development, people are really concerned on Rantoul Street because it affects our traffic, our water, our infrastructure, our police, our fire. So we have to look at that. And I know the city has, but the idea is, what do you want this city to look like in 20 years? To me, you have to worry about the character of the city. As much as you want to have a strong tax base right now, and to have that, you know, so the money doesn't uh, go up for our, our homeowners, which it always does, as, we, as you mentioned. But we have to have a character of the city. We have to have green space. I, I understand the tax base that it creates, but you also have to have the character and the green space downtown. You don't want a concrete jungle downtown because as soon as you start building those buildings, you're going to be stuck with those buildings for the next hundred years. We have to worry about our character of our community and our downtown, think of the long term. So I would agree that there is a need for thoughtful balance as we continue to think about development in our city. I believe that all cities need some level of new growth to bring in needed funds that help us to be able to, to uh, finance the things that we need. Things like a new police station or better services or to be able to put more money towards our schools. And we don't want all of that to come from our taxpayers. So there's, there's a need to find this important and careful balance. I, I think that we talk about development, and I know a lot of people have said, but how much is too much and when does it stop? And so one of the places that I've thought about, because Rantoul Street is, is currently under development, it's happening, but sort of the next area for us to think about is the Bass River area. And when the rezoning for the Bass River comes before the city council, I would love to be a part of the conversation to be able to think to pause and to think holistically about how we would like that kind of space to look, where the open space would be left, and how we can do some resiliency planning for those waterfront areas to ensure that any development that we do is smart and ready for the storms and the rising sea levels that we know are coming. So I would love to be thoughtful in that area with, uh, with colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. I think we need to take a step back uh, I've been on the council the past few years and we've seen tremendous development on Rantoul Street and it's all good development. It's transit oriented development. We want people to live here in Beverly, get on the train and work in Boston. Now that the Thomas Ford, uh, pro the tr Thomas Ford property has been permitted, I think now we might want to stop, take a step back and say, how much more development can we handle here in the city of Beverly? Uh, I think Tim mentioned police, fire, our water supply, and our schools. Because as much as detailed studies show that people renting or buying on Rantoul Street aren't going to have kids, they're eventually going to have kids. Uh, and right now our schools are crowded as it is. We hear from parents, class sizes, and other things. But uh, when reelected in January, I think we all need to sit down and develop what our vision wants to be. Maybe revisit the master plan again, which was last redone in 2000. Thank you. What I like about the growth, like Paul, is that it is transit-oriented development. That means that families here in Beverly will not need to be buying vehicles or to be using uh, a lot of fuel. So they will have more money in their pockets, which they can spend for other things, and which they can spend in our city, which means our city will get more revenue. I also like it because it is, uh, when we build more units, it's going to ease uh, the demand for units, and it is probably going to relax uh, rental prices. Uh, I expect that once that development comes up, uh, there's going to, uh, to be growth of other businesses that are going to reflect the renters, you know, things like yoga, gyms, restaurants, and things like that. 
And so the city is going to have uh, an image of walkabilities, and we are going to use the walkways and the bicycle lanes, which from my own perspective is a good thing because when people walk, they will remain healthy, we will avoid obesity and heart disease. Thank you. So I've spent the last few months knocking on doors, and I can tell you that this is by far the number one issue that I hear about from residents, concerns about residential development that's happening in our city. And it's concerns about parking and traffic, it's concerns about class sizes in our schools, concerns about maintaining city services like police and fire. This is the biggest issue facing Beverly over the next few years, and you know, especially when you consider potential for large-scale development on Folly Hill, the reuse of Briscoe, um, and the development of, of Depot Square in, in the Bass River area. I'm opposed to large-scale development on Folly Hill. I think that would be a bad thing for our city. And I think we need to look long and hard at the reuse of, of Briscoe before any decision is made to sell and com convert that to apartments. It's, Beverly is an attractive place for, for people to want to live and, and developers to want to build, and that's a good thing, and we need new growth, but I think we do need to strike the right balance to ensure that we maintain city services and quality of life for our residents. Thanks. Why don't you keep the mic down there, Matt? So, uh, great. Uh, I think we did great on that first round, folks. Thanks so much. Um, so let's just keep moving right along. I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. Um, in March 2016, Governor Baker signed legislation that declared that Massachusetts has an opioid epidemic. And I understand that it is now being declared a national public health emergency by our president. Uh, we have seen the effects uh, here in Beverly. What is your strategy for tackling this crisis? and related substance abuse issues in Beverly. We'll start with Matt come this way. <clears throat> Thank you. So the opioid crisis uh, is, is definitely a national epidemic that that's touched us all. It's a complicated issue and, and requires a long-term strategy at, at all levels of government. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, this has been a priority of Governor Baker's and, and the governor, governor's office. Um, in 2016, that legislation that he signed uh, significantly reduced over-prescribing of prescription drugs. Um, over the last few years, you know, we have seen a drop, finally. Um, we're a long way from a solution, but it is a positive sign. Um, every, every month, uh, Police Chief John Lurlesher sends the City Council a, a report, a monthly police report, and we see firsthand all the overdoses that are happening in our city, all the heroin-related arrests that are happening. And I, I just want to say, you know, I applaud the work of our, our local police officers. They're equipped with Narcan. They're saving lives every day. Our drug unit is, is aggressively pursuing heroin dealers and, and sending a message that, you know, th they're not welcome in our city. I think we need to continue to, um, you know, support their efforts, and we need to continue to spread awareness about this issue uh, at all levels of government. I am going to choose to see the glass as half full as far as opioid is concerned, since we have legalized marijuana, I expect that uh, this, um, this decrim um, legalization of marijuana is going to uh, help in easing um, addiction to opioids. And I, I'm expecting that the city will develop ordinances that can allow the provision of community training on the use of naloxone. Naloxone is the, uh, the antidote for opioid, so that people can get more time to get to hospital. I also um, expect that we are going to create referral programs and good Samaritan laws where friends can call on behalf of their friends without fearing that they are going to be arrested by the police. And I also expect that we are going to create communi community coalitions for community mobilizations. Thank you. Um, I think it's real simple. We need harsher penalties for those that sell and distribute drugs to especially our young people here in the community. Uh, I hate to disagree with a candidate about, about the legalization of marijuana. I've seen it firsthand. That's what kids start with when they're 15 or 16 years old. And I know Chief Lala Shur and his force know that once that wears off, uh, the kids nowadays, they're adding to that, adding different chemicals to make that marijuana even stronger. 
and that leads to more of an addiction. I mean, I, just, I told this story at the UU Church. I had an employee, I've been taking care of him since he was 15. Some days he's good, some days he's bad. Uh, he was on a really good streak, got a little down on the dumps, and next thing you know, he's on the front page of the Salem Evening News. He had a bad day and he OD'd and needed Narcan to bring him back. Uh, harsher penalties and, um, for all involved. So in doing some research about this issue, because as we know and as we heard, it's an important issue not only for our commonwealth but for our country, one of the examples that I found really intriguing and potentially instructive for local municipalities like our own is that of the city of Boston, which has had tremendous success in reducing the number of opioid-related deaths. And one of their innovative programs was to put Narcan not only in the hands of police officers, and as Matt said, our Beverly police officers are doing an amazing job on the front lines every single day, but they also provided training for community members to have Narcan, particularly for family members and friends of addicts or addicts themselves, because they are the people who are most likely to see an overdose as it's happening and can more quickly act to save a life. I do believe though that saving lives is only the first step. We know that addiction is a broad issue and I would advocate for continuing to work some, with some of our existing committees like Be Healthy Beverly, the Mayor's Task Force, but be able to make those more robust so that we can do more follow-up and long-term support for those struggling with addiction and be able to really help to end this crisis. This is a serious concern that affects everybody. I work for the, for the YMCA, as I told you earlier. It's one of our strategic initiatives. And what we do is we work with the local hospital, Leahy, and Beverly Hospital, and Addison Gilbert Hospital to try to educate people. I understand that Narcon it, it can be helpful, but also sometimes they utilize that people who are users knowing that they're going to get help. That's, that does help save lives, but I think what you need to do is we need to start young, educate, uh, children and parents and understand that it's an issue for everybody. The idea of uh, penalizing these people, um, I think we need to rehabilitate these people and educate them and help them, not necessarily incarcerate them. Um, so I think that's a big piece we need to do. Um, and also working with the Mayor's Task Force um, is an important step, but we all need to work together, not alone as a city agency, but also uh, with our other nonprofits, with our hospitals, and our community, and the people at large. Uh, going last, you're going to hear a little bit of a repeat of everything you just heard. Honestly, it is a, a uh, community issue. I think I read uh, that there were 63 deaths last year here in Beverly alone. As far as I'm concerned, that's 63 uh, uh, more deaths than we really should have had. Um, I think building off of what Gloucester started uh, with their police department, that we should have a community outreach program uh, with, with, um, without uniform police officers though, make it a welcoming environment, um, an e education facility. I think we should create a partnership with Beverly Hospital and um, take advantage of the resources that they have and uh, start young, start educating uh, our children young. Unfortunately, it's not all about education. Um, it is mental illness. It is a dependency, and um, that's why I think as a community, we need to be welcoming and letting everyone know it's not so bad to be addicted, but um, we can help you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, great job. Uh, also, shout out to the timekeepers for doing fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna, have, we're gonna have time for plenty of questions the way we're going. Let's, uh, let's shift to the issue of education. Um, as taxpayers know, I believe the majority, meaning above 50% of our taxes do go to cover education. Uh, so it's a big item, it's on all of our minds whether we have children in schools or not. Um, we have seen uh, tremendous progress in the physical state of our high school and soon to open middle school. And my, uh, my younger daughter gets to be the inaugural class for sixth grade to go to that, so I'm very excited. So is she. What I want to ask you about is now we've sorted out the physical situation. What about what is happening in the classroom? How do we, will we see improvements in academic achievement? What innovative ways can we 
um, elevate the performance of our students in these beautiful, shiny buildings. <laughs> Any ideas? I'm gonna, sorry, I didn't, I didn't warn you in advance, but let's start in the middle of this time with, uh, with Paul, and then come towards Julie, and then we'll eventually go down to Matt. Yeah, and it's funny. We didn't, we, didn't, uh, we didn't predict this problem of passing the mic, but you guys have figured it out. <laughs> All right, Jim, one more time on the second half of the question. I wasn't ready. I was ready no, to hear from just, Tim. Just in a nutshell, the physical state of our schools is fantastic. Uh, what's going on in the classrooms? What can we do to elevate the, the actual student achievement? Uh, it, can, it can be better. We all know. But how? It's not easy. I think our teachers and our administrators are doing a great job in all of our schools. Uh, I think out of the five elementary schools, we have four level ones and one level two, so the kids are succeeding. Uh, we had a problem with class sizes a couple of years ago. The city council and the mayor listened to uh, concerned parents, and more money was advocated to solve that problem. What we're going to do this year is every year we have a, well, I hope to do this if I'm still here in January, we have an annual meeting with the Beverly School Committee and the Beverly City Council. It's usually in March, and it's usually March, uh, April, or May, and it's a dog and pony show after the budgets are already done. We're going to try and get together in January to set the school budget priorities and to see how the council can assist in that before it's too long, far along in the process. Thank you. Yeah, come this way. Yeah. This way. So I would definitely uh, affirm and would love to be a part of the idea of getting the city council, the school committee, the administration together early in the process and to be able to think creatively about what the needs of our schools are. I do just want to lift up and celebrate some of the great things that I think are happening in our schools right now and I think we're continuing on this trajectory. Right now, Beverly High School is offering classes that are much more diverse than ever before. Classes like engineering, environmental engineering, robotics, offering a senior uh, internship program, the REACH program. And our district is focused on project-based learning across the district. We've added STEAM coordinators at our elementary schools and at all levels of our schools. And I feel like where our, our school committee has been, has been leading us and where this, uh, the city has been supportive is to be able to focus on some of this hands-on, important initiative and project-based learning. I think that's where our students are getting educated as, as whole people. And uh, a new area that I think we can continue to push into is social-emotional learning, really preparing our students as, as whole people to be able to to, to go out into the world and to be successful. I do agree we need to start uh, a lot sooner in the process. I think by charter we have to have at the meeting with the school committee uh, and the city council. There probably needs to be more uh, collaboration and communication uh, with the school committee. Um, obviously it's a school committee is the overseer of the schools, but we need to be there to be supportive of that. They talk about the $4,000 price tag for kindergarten. That discussion happened in, uh, during the budget season. That needs to happen in January or even December because you have much better discussions and you can deliberate in a respectful way. When it gets down to crunch time, it's very difficult to have those discussions, not only with kindergarten, but the other idea is the curriculum. You know, all, the teachers are always looking at curriculum. And I think it's important to um, educate not only our students, but also our teachers as well to try to make a, a better school system. The facilities are great, but the idea of trying to get to the elementary, having had four kids go through there, and a teacher that teaches, right, my wife that teaches there now, um, I think we really need to be, to be creative, not only with the facil facilities, but also the curriculum. Uh, Tim, Tim I can, uh, just let me break with the, the protocol for a second. Since you did bring up uh, free kindergarten, or the cost of kindergarten, <clears throat> We did get a question from one of the audience, when is Beverly going to have free kindergarten help? Um, do, do you mind saying a bit about that? And then uh, Paul and Julie, if you want to add your opinion on that too, and then subsequently anyone who wants to mention the kindergarten question is welcome too. Absolutely. It costs us about $600,000 to have to operate full day kindergarten. The state education board tells us that cities and towns should not be charging for kindergarten. We're not gonna get there, we can't make false promises, but we need to get there at some point, especially, you know, stop moving the, uh, this year, maybe we bring it down. But there's also, 
with it costing $600,000, where is that money gonna come from? You need to be creative on the school side and the city side to cut some, it has to come from someplace else. So it's not an easy decision, not that something's gonna happen overnight, but one that we have to entertain because the achievement gap is an important piece of we need to take a look at. You have children not going to full day kindergarten that really need it the most. Thanks. Uh, Julia, Paul, do you wanna add something? And subsequent candidates, we'll give you an extra 30 seconds, don't worry, since we added this sub-question. So the question of the kindergarten fee has been something that I've been talking with residents about since I pulled papers to run. It's a really high priority for me to be able to get us as a city to a place where we can reduce and remove that fee. A big part of that is because we're a standalone in charging this fee. If you look at neighboring communities in our area, we're really one of the last. Beverly and Marblehead are the last in our area that are charging for kindergarten. And um, I agree that the achievement gap is something that we need to focus on. Getting all of our children in from their earliest public school experience days onward on equal footing to me is incredibly important. And I believe in Beverly we care a lot about education. We have an excellent district with excellent teachers and administrators working very hard. And yet, if you look at us from the outside, charging $4,000 for full day kindergarten and setting up this, this inequity doesn't reflect, I don't believe, accurately who we are in terms of our, our passion for education and our passion for equity in education. So I would advocate at a, a more creative planning session early on in the budget process that that's one of the topics that could be discussed with the school committee, city council, and administration together. Thanks. So we'll continue to Brian and Brian, uh, Matt and Esther. Take Can I go? Paul, Paul, take your time. Sorry. Not a problem. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I won't take my time. Take, take 30 <laughs> seconds. You're looking in a good mood. Oh, that's good, James. Uh, you just held up 15. Come on. Uh, gone are the days where we can pat ourselves on the back to, that we offer half-day kindergarten. Everybody knows that's a parent that have sent their kids to half-day kindergarten that it's just not enough. It's not enough time for the student, and it's not enough time for the parent if they want to do something especially stay-at-home mothers. Um, I asked uh, school committee president Chris Silverstein to organize a brainstorming session with the school committee, and that happened a couple of weeks ago where they sat in a room and they threw everything at a board, and we're gonna see what sticks. And that would be the main focus of our discussion in January. It's full free day kindergarten, and there are a number of other things. Class sizes, uh, fees for athletics, fees for band. Uh, it, we have to figure out what they really want, what are their priorities, and how the city council can find the funding necessary. Great. So, uh, all right, since we're down there, okay, we'll go Esther, then Matt, then back to uh, Brian, and take a minute and a half. And if you want to address, sorry, go ahead, yeah. We've been giving them another minute. Yeah. Minute. yeah. Take two minutes. If, if, you want to, if you want to address the kindergarten question, it's up to you, it's optional. Okay. In 1997, I was fortunate enough to be seconded by the Kenyan government to UNESCO to go and research in India about how to make the Kenyan education more successful. I did get a chance to face it. A particular school that was in northern India, uh, it was a school of women. I saw something that they were doing. It seems a little bit radical, but I think it makes sense. Before the classes began, the whole school did one hour of physical exercise. And when they went to the classroom, they performed very well. I, it might sound very radical, but I think that has been proven to help children to uh, understand their work better. Now, about the Kida Garden, I think it is inappropriate for parents to pay for a core part of public education. And I think the city should find a way of helping parents to pay for the kindergarten, uh, because if the parents were left to pay for it, some will opt to do half day, and others will even probably decide to homeschool their children if they can afford it, and that is going to create educational disparity. So I think it's upon the city. There are so many ways because other cities have done it and I think we can also do it as a community. Thank you. So I believe 
education is a fundamental priority of our local government in providing the funding uh, for our schools to excel is, is our job. Uh, as Paul and others have mentioned, you know, our schools and our teachers, they do a very good job and, and we should be proud of that, but we, we need to continue to get to improve and get better. Um, I've been a strong supporter of our schools during my four years on the council. We approved the new middle school, as I mentioned, state-of-the-art facility. It's a 21st century learning environment that will drastically improve the experience for our students, teachers, and administrators. But I think over the next few years, the two big issues facing our schools that, that we should be working on, we've talked about them, the $4,000 full-day kindergarten fee, excuse me, and the class size concerns. On the full-day kindergarten fee, 80% of school districts across the state offer free full-day kindergarten. Of the 20% that charge, Beverly is among the very few that charge as much as 4,000. This is an unfair burden on our young families and we need to get rid of it. I've proposed over the last few years uh, reducing the fee by $500 a year for eight years. I agree it's hard to absorb a $600,000 hit in one year, but let's start, let's start doing it over time. If this is a priority, let's make it happen. I, I've been a strong advocate of it and I will continue to be, be a strong advocate. On the class sizes, Beverly's student to teacher ratio is above the statewide average and it's above the, uh, a lot of our surrounding communities. I, I think this is something we need to continue to look at in, again, providing the funding that our schools need to excel. Again, it, budgets come down to priorities and, and discipline and it, it means saying no to some things and, and choosing some things over others. And I think these two things, these are priorities and we need to continue to look at these and, and find the money to do it. I proposed cuts in the past and I'll continue to propose cuts to, to help our schools. useful. There you go. All right. Great. Okay. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, free full day kindergarten and uh, the original question was uh, how to better our schools. I don't think there's a better way to uh, uh, advance our school system than, than start children at the right age. And uh, that age is, is the kindergarten. We do need to find a way to uh, make it affordable uh, both for our, um, our families who have kids go to school and for the rest of the community uh, who has to absorb the burden of what the cost is. Um, but the number one reason why I'm running for city council um, is to advocate for the special needs program. And I think that um, we're gonna have a big problem in 2020 because in the 2010 census, they said one in every 68 uh, children have autism. And then in 2013, they completely changed the autism spectrum. They took the Rett syndrome and the Asperger's and all the labels out, and they said, it's level one, two, and three now. And then more children were put on the autistic spectrum as a level one. So when we take a look at the numbers in 2020, it's not gonna be one in 68, it's gonna be one in somewhere in the 50s, maybe even under 50. And that is a tremendous expense on the community. And I think what's gonna happen is we're all gonna look around and say, why didn't we think of this? Thank you. Thanks. So I think, we'll, why don't we start on the Matt's side of the table and come this way. Uh, do, we do, do we just do that? No, we start with Paul, right? So we'll just go the other direction. Yeah, this time we'll go back to, to Matt. So I'll just give you a warning. Um, so, I'm just looking at the time, I think, I think one more question for all to respond to, and then um, we'll give them ample time for their concluding statement, and then we should be able to wrap it up. Um, don't forget about the refreshments, some good stuff back there, we put a lot of effort into laying it out nicely, so help yourself. Um, so, I uh, want to ask another question about uh, development, Beverly. Um, I can tell you from personal experience, I moved here because of the waterfront. Uh, my first view of Beverly was Lynch Park. That was a pretty good view. They said, we're gonna, and I, my, my, my wife and fiance at the time, we all said, let's live near here. Why do we have to look further? Right? I didn't know about all the rest of the waterfront. Uh, subsequently, I've learned about it. Uh, it's very intriguing. Um, it's a, one of the greatest assets of Beverly. Uh, yet it seems that the potential is never quite realized. What is your strategy uh, for the city to develop a waterfront that can be used in a sustainable manner uh, and that can ensure public access 
and enjoyment for everyone of Beverly. We'll start with Matt and come this way. Yeah. Or we can start, it doesn't matter. We start Esther, then Matt. Go ahead, Esther. Um, that's a hard question for me, but um, when you mentioned the waterfront project, what comes to my mind is uh, uh, ways in which that we can uh, we can protect it against climate change. Uh, I think that we need to make the water resiliency plan work so that we, uh, in case we have a hurricane or something like that, then we do not have a problem. So I'm, I'm not very familiar with the waterfront project. So I think I'll pass. So when I think of the waterfront, I think of the McDonald's building, which has been vacant since I was a little kid. Um, and I think most people I talk to would love to see a restaurant there. Uh, a place where, yeah, right. A place where you can go and get a drink on the waterfront like many of our surrounding maritime uh, communities. Uh, the big obstacle there was the designated port area, which was a designation the state placed on uh, that whole area um, back in 1978. When I first joined the council, uh, Mayor Cahill proposed a review of the, of the designated port area to remove it, and we were very supportive as a council in seeing that uh, designation removed. So the state actually came in, did a review, and determined that the marine industrial uses that they were concerned about preserving haven't existed for a long time and aren't going to come back. So we were able to get that DPA removed. That has been the first obstacle in, in, in sort of developing the waterfront. Secondly, we took a look at zoning on the waterfront uh, and working with the administration, we rezoned uh, the waterfront area and created a Beverly Harbor zoning district. Uh, there's one owner who owns a majority of that area, but I'm confident at the right time that, that you know, he'll seek to, to redevelop. As far as McDonald's building goes, we're getting close. We're working with the state. It's a complicated issue due to a grant that, that the city used to purchase that from the uh, Department of Environmental uh, Protection. But we are uh, very hopeful that uh, something will be built there soon, and it's definitely a priority. Well, I wish I went before Matt, because Matt took all my words. We've been working on the same thing for the past couple of years, and actually the past couple of decades. I remember being at uh, the temple used to have a big debate that was televised and Marty Goldberg used to sit there with those cards and that first year I was terrified to go over my time. But now this is really a big deal, talking about it here. Uh, the McDonald's property, uh, Mayor Cahill may have some good news for us in the next month. We already went out and had an RFP once uh, and the bidders did not want to um, meet the requirement for public access, which is very important. We can't sell the property because then we would have to pay back the grant that we used to buy the property. Uh, the, next, um, the next RFP that goes out has to include, make it a little more um, advantageous for the business owner who's putting up his own capital. They have, to, they have to be able to make some money and I think that's been the problem in the past. Uh, and that's just the start. And then we move on to the Bass River rezoning project that we should hear about sometimes, sometime in 2018. So like Matt and everybody else in the room, McDonald's building is the first thing that comes to my mind too. I remember being very little and eating outside on the water there. And since that time, it is true that there really isn't a place that we can go and eat outside on the water in Beverly. And I think all of us would like to see that be able to happen. I, when I think about the waterfront, I also do think about the Bass River. You know, I, I'm cognizant of how much waterfront we actually do have. And so one of the things that I would love to see is as we continue to develop some of these different waterfront areas, I mentioned before resiliency planning, being thoughtful about how we prepare ourselves for uh, rising sea level and climate change, but also leaving open space and access so that residents, particularly in the Bass River area, can go and be able to walk along some of that beautiful waterfront that we enjoy. 
One unique challenge that I see to developing Beverly's waterfront in a way that attracts people from outside of the city, the way that you might think of Gloucester or Newburyport, where you can walk along the water as you shop or go to restaurants, is that large parts of our waterfront are not contiguous with our walkable downtown. And so one of the things that I've been trying to think creatively about is how we might help to increase flow from our downtown down to Dane Street, Lynch Park, those areas, um, whether it be by foot or by bike. Um, and I'd like to think creatively about that as we go forward. I applaud the mayor for lifting the DPA. Actually, it was the city that kind of did that in 19, late 1970s. Uh, they kind of did it to ourselves. Protect to do the right thing, but things have changed, and I applaud the mayor uh, for moving forward on uh, working with the state to do that. We all talk about McDonald's, but do you know that Beverly actually has 13 miles of coastline? Most of that is residential. You can't compare it to necessarily Gloucester, which a lot of that, um, it's a bigger area and has much more area to develop their, their downtown waterfront. We don't have a big area. Some of the areas we do have um, are the, uh, the Bass River. In 2001, it's, it's gonna be 2018 like Paul said, in 2001, the master plan was a big process. It recommended then to rezone the Bass River. It is now 2018 and we've done nothing with that. It's an important resource. Something we need to do, something, you know, not uh, do it today, we also need to dredge the Bass River. That's a big piece of it, so you can have recreational boating there as well. Sorry. Uh, to build off of what my colleagues have just said uh, with respect to the McDonald's site and other waterfront areas of our downtown, uh, of our town, um, one of the things we can do to, to bring people to the downtown from the waterfront and vice versa is to have some type of a trolley or bus service. Um, that's an idea that I have uh, to do that. But when I think of the waterfront here in Beverly, um, lately I've been thinking about OBR Park and the erosion and what's happening over there and comparing it to, say, how nice Lynch Park is or West Beach or something like that. Um, we have an old saying in retail management, uh, put your money on the ponies that win races for you. Um, and I think that's what's happening here in town. I really think we need to take a little more um, of, a, of a look at the community as a whole and not just a couple of specific areas. We really do need to, to consider what's happening in that area of uh, Rileside and respect um, the environment and what's happening to the shoreline. Thank you. Great, thanks uh, to all candidates and to the timekeepers. Uh, Timekeepers did a great job. You're a little bit too friendly. You're, you were laughing too much at Paul Guanzi when he said he wasn't afraid of you. Uh, <laughs> <That's good. laughs> lost the point. So just to uh, just to say that this has been very very informative. Uh, I uh, it's surprising how much you can learn when uh, six knowledgeable people uh, present some facts and information and opinions on, on these matters. So this has been really great. Um, that's it for the formal questioning part of, of the evening. And I want to give each of the candidates uh, one more chance to make their concluding statement. Timekeepers, you want to give them two minutes? They're in a good mood. Uh, yeah, we're doing well on time, so take, take up to two minutes. Well, we, we, we collected those when we came in, so, yeah. And I think, uh, just in the interest of time, I mean, I, I'm aiming for 9 o'clock, but, uh, um, but afterwards, when we're kind of billing and mingling, uh, the audience, sure, I mean, the candidates are here, so approach them and uh, ask them your questions. Uh, so, do you want two and a half? No, I think let's, let's stick with two minutes, and then we'll, that'll wrap it up around 9 o'clock, and uh, that'll be great. So why don't we start? Uh, well, can we go? Since the mic's here, Brian, do you, do you mind starting? I started four times. You did? Started once. Okay. We'll go Tim, and then we'll go down and come back to Brian. And Brian, you're going to close it then. I'll close it too. Okay. <laughs> then what? Tim, and then Brian. We'll go back down the end. Up to you if you want to stand, sit, take a couple minutes, make your case. Make my case. <laughs> This has been a long electric season. 
I've done this for a number of times, but it's been a great election season. It's been great meeting a lot of the council, uh, future counselors here. It's been an um, exciting time, but a lot of challenges as well. You get out there and meet. This is the best part of time about meeting people, going out in the community, knocking on doors. It's kind of get an idea of a feel of what the community is. And I really believe Belly is a special place. But going out in the community, talking to people at the train stations, at their doors, you believe it. We're not always going to ag agree. And that's okay. The national politics, when they disagree, they're not a great example to follow. But I think, <laughs> but I think we have disagreed on a few issues here and there, and we've been you know, friendly to each other. It's okay. And that's what makes Beverly special. Beverly's a special community. I believe I have the experience, having been on the council before, having had children in the school system, understand the school system, but I understand the hard work that it takes to be a city councilor. But sometimes when we're up here, we're up here talking, don't just look at what we say or what our pamphlets say. Look at what we've done in the community. I believe over the past years of my uh, adult life, and even in going in from high school. I've been a leader in this community. I've cared about this community, but I've also accomplished many goals that I set out for myself and also this community. That's what I think you need to take a look at. But also, when we're up here, there's gonna be nine of us on the city council. You need to find a council that's gonna work together, build consensus for the better good of the city. Work with Mayor Cahill. Again, we're not always gonna agree but the, not forget why we're here, to make a better Beverly. And that's the number one reason why I'm running. When, when um, Jason Silva called me up last spring, he said, I want you to run for city council. You have the vision and the drive to be a city councilor again. So that's why I'm, I'm back running for my kids in the future so they can raise their kids here. Thank you, and I ask one of your three votes next Tuesday. Thank you. Okay, um, the city council here in Beverly um, is an excellent group of individuals and um, if there wasn't an open seat, I wouldn't have run. Um, I see no reason to, to change a great thing. Um, I really support Mayor Cahill and what he's done for our community. I have been here long enough to see the changes and the impact that he has put on our downtown. Every time I think of the downtown, I think of the Bell Market, the property that I sold to the Goldbergs, and um, um, nobody was looking to buy that property before make, Mayor Cahill became mayor. Nobody was. Um, my experience in real estate and in development in areas like that, I think will be valuable. Um, I have the foresight to see what's going to happen next, especially in the area of development, and there's a lot of that happening in our community. Um, and with that, I ask for one of your three votes for City Council, November 7th. So I am really proud and really honored to have had the opportunity for the past 10 years to do the work that I have done professionally in our community. I've gotten to work with countless young people, middle schoolers and high schoolers through my professional work at First Baptist, helping them to connect with volunteer organizations in the community and to put their, their heart and their soul back into this community that they love too. So we've worked with Beverly Bootstraps, Harbor Lake Community Partners, Family Promise, all organizations that Beverly is so lucky to have. And in doing that, I've also had the chance to meet many people and hear many stories and think about the work that we could continue to do together. And so I am excited about this opportunity that I've had to run. I've met countless people at doors who have been so generous to give me their time when I appear unexpected and knock on their door. I've met people at meet and greets in homes. I've met them at train stations and at forums like this. And I've gotten to hear your stories, your hopes, your dreams, your desires for this community that we love. I would be honored to have the opportunity to represent you at the city level and to be able to take those 10 years of professional experience and to, to bring it with me to the city level, to elevate your voices, your hopes, your needs for this city. I'm also extremely proud to have been endorsed in this race by the North Shore Labor Council, the Mass Women's Political Caucus, 
Ward 2 Councillor Estelle Rand, uh, outgoing at-large Councillor Jason Silva, and Ward 4 School Committee Rep John Milady. It means an incredible amount to me that as a newcomer to city politics, these people who have experience and knowledge have put faith and trust in me, and I would be honored to get to represent you and to serve in a way that would really do, do justice to the trust that's been placed in me. I would love to bring a fresh energy and some new ideas to the city council to get to work with the other eight on the council. And so if you agree, then I would be honored to have one of your three votes on November 7th. Thank you very much. Great night, great audience, great building, and a great moderator. Nice job tonight, James. Don't forget the time. <laughs> time is very, well, a little too lenient for the moderator. You'll have to work on that for two years from now. Um, thanks to everybody for coming out tonight. And I hope that everybody in the room realizes that the people of Beverly that are going to go out and vote on Tuesday, November 7th, have six excellent choices to serve as counselor at large. Uh, it's been great campaigning. Two years ago, there was, it wasn't a contested race. There were three incumbents running for three seats, so it was very, very quiet. This year's gonna be quiet because this is really the only contested race other than Ward 3. It's been great campaigning with my colleague, Matt St. Hilaire, and talking about the things that we've done over the past two years. Um, and it's been great renewing that old friendly rivalry I have with my friend, um, former city council president, Tim Flaherty. I was excited when he pulled papers this year because I know how much he loves the city. Um, challenges over the next two years. Oh, and I forgot to say, it's been awesome knowing, getting to know these three people. I knew Brian a little, I know him a lot more. I knew very little of Julie and I've been so impressed by, especially her oratory skills. And Esther, you bring a freshness to the whole, wherever you go, so thank you. Um, and if I were voting, well, I'm going to vote, but if I had to choose, <laughs> I would have a tough time. I might even might leave myself off the ballot. No. Challenges over the next two years include finding a balance in residential development, waterfront revi uh, revitalization, and setting priorities with the, within the capital expenditure plan. We can all look forward to Rantoul Street being finished and the opening of the new middle school. I look forward to being part of the decision-making process for over the next two years. And to quote my old friend Bill Coughlin, who told me experience is necessary to run for city council. Um, I have the experience to do the job and a great working relationship with a lot of people here in the city. That said, I respectfully ask once again for you to choose me as one of your three votes for councilor at large. Thank you. I represent diversity, and as a military mom, I am carrying a family legacy to serve as a United States citizen in public service. I am currently completing a doctorate program specializing in health advocacy and leadership. I have completed a master's degree in emergency and disaster management. I hold a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing, and I'm a registered nurse here in Massachusetts. I also hold a bachelor's degree in business administration. All of these professional and academic qualifications will enable me to serve proudly as your counselor at large here in Beverly. My candidacy has been groundbreaking here in Beverly's political history. I will go down in history as the first woman of Af African descent to run as a councillor at large in this city. Speaking from my personal experience, marginalized people, and especially people of color, have a unique set of challenges that must be addressed skillfully. As a voter, you have as a voter in the November 7th election, 
you have the ability to faithfully address their need of security, identity, belonging, agency, by giving me one of your three votes. I am offering, for your one vote, I am offering four counselors at large, a woman, a person of color, an immigrant, and a candidate who wants to make a difference in the lives of all Beverly citizens. This is the best way to ensure that Beverly is served with justice and equity. God bless you, and thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm running for re-election because I believe I have the experience to continue to help make the right decisions for Beverly so it remains a great place to live and raise a family for future generations. I got my start working for Governor Paul Salucci as an intern uh, on his successful campaign for governor in 1998. I went to work for him in the governor's office after I graduated. Spent the majority of the last 18 years working in state and local government and in the political arena. Working at the state level, I've developed relationships with elected officials and government leaders across Massachusetts, and I have a broad understanding of the issues that are impacting cities and towns, as well as the best practices and resources we can leverage to address these issues. I believe that's an asset to the city council and to our city. As your city councilor at large, I currently serve as a chair of the subcommittee on legal affairs and ordinances, and I also currently serve as a city council liaison to the school committee's subcommittee on finance and facilities. I have good working relationships with Mayor Cahill, my colleagues on the City Council and the School Committee, as well as with department heads and community leaders. And I have direct experience working on the issues currently facing our city today. I'm proud of my track record over the last four years, and if re-elected, I will continue to work hard to represent you. I will remain a strong voice for Beverly's taxpayers and for fiscal responsibility. I will remain committed to transparency, and I will continue to listen to your feedback. And I will continue to be a strong supporter of our schools. Beverly's future is bright, and I look forward to working hard to keep us headed in the right direction. I respectfully ask for one of your three votes for City Councilor at Large on Tuesday. Thank you. I would, uh, on behalf of the Beverly Cove Improvement Association, I would like to thank all six candidates uh, for a very constructive and informative debate. How much time do I have? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a stop. Yeah. And I'd also like to uh, once again recognize uh, Mayor Kay Hill for coming tonight and for our city council at Ward 4, Scott Houseman and John Lady, our school committee member. And of course, all of uh, the citizens of Beverly who are going to go out and vote pretty soon next week. I know all you guys are going to go out and vote. Make sure you bring your friends. Uh, we don't want, we don't, we, uh, the stakes are high enough that low turnout is not, is ill-advised. Um, so with that, any further questions? It's a wrap.